morning, everybody. Finally, I thought it's time for another military history Q&A. I can get to answer some of your questions. And instead, I got one question that led me to spend the next couple of hours explaining in detail all the armaments of the Polish armed forces leading up to World War II. The weaponry, what they had, members, and how many people, planes, ships, and I will break down the weaponry they all had. Before I left for Europe, Tom wrote me if I could please, pretty please, find out something about Polish-made anti-tank cannons. Well, I tried, and I couldn't find any. So I thought to myself, well, why don't we just break down what all of the Polish military actually had leading up to World War II. Now, Poland, as a lot of other new states after World War I, was just coming into its own and began racing its first military. And they were pretty much relegated to getting whatever scraps of military equipment, gear, weaponry from other countries that they could scrounge up in whatever country of Europe they could, leading to a lot of different countries' munitions being present in Poland at the outbreak of World War II. Not until 1937 did the Polish army actually realize it was time to upgrade their military, and rewrite their doctrine. It was a little late. In 1939, when Germany started rattling the cage on the border, they were lacking in modern equipment. The modernization had taken a little too long and was started a little too late. In 1939, a partial uh, mobilization was ordered by the Polish government, one in March, August, and then on the 30th August, a general mobilization was ordered and uh, along the western frontiers, of course. Uh, Poland deployed about seven armies, a tactical group which accounted for over half of her infantry divisions, and nearly three-quarters of the cavalry brigades. The remaining of the army was in process of formation and to be used for uh, you know, reinforcements and operational reserves. This is what the map looked like at that time. Now let's break down exactly what was what on the 39th when the Germans and Polish finally got into it. Hostility broke out and the Germans invaded. They had 39 infantry divisions, 11 cavalry brigades, and two motorized brigades. And the infantry regiments had three 1,900 officers and men in each. One battalion with 600 men of cavalry. There was three or four cavalry brigades. There was 273 officers in the cavalry brigades. Infantry divisions, the numbers of men and NCOs are not exactly known. But there were 16,492 men in every infantry division. There were 7,184 men in every cavalry brigade, out of which 6,911 was NCOs and privates. Infantry divisions had 378 machine guns each not known for the cavalry brigade. The infantry brigades had 99 mortars, 81 50 millimeters, and 18 81 millimeters. The cavalry brigades had 11 mortars, 9 50 millimeters, and two 81 millimeters. The infantry divisions also had 42 howitzers and field guns. 30 of them were 75 millimeters M1897, and they had 12 100 millimeter Austrian M14 howitzers. The cavalry brigades had 16 75 millimeter M1897. You see, there's already a lot of weaponry going on right here. Now they had, speaking of the question that was originally asked me, they had 27 37 millimeter anti-tank guns. However, none of them were actually Polish made. The cavalry brigades had 18 anti-tank guns of 37 millimeters. It is not known how many anti-aircraft weapons cannons they had of the 40 millimeters. It's just not known for the infantry brigades. However, the cavalry brigades had two. Appalling lack of anti-aircraft weaponry going on here. The total strength of the Polish army at this point was 1.5 million soldiers, about a million on the front line, with 4,500 guns and mortars and 2,000 anti-tank and 3,000 anti-aircraft guns. But they did have a few armored vehicles. They had 170 7TP light tanks. It was built on the British Vickers 6-ton Mark E type under license. 
However, they did a few improvements on this. They gave it a new, better, powerful diesel engine. They stuck the 37mm anti-tank gun on top of it. The slightly thicker armor was 17mm as opposed to 13 on the front. Uh, ventilation gave it a radio. Of the 6-ton Vickers, they had 50. Of the Renault R35, they had 53. Of the Renault FT17, they had 67. They also had 700 TK tanks, which was a light tankette that was built roughly based on the British Carden Lloyd tankette, but with an improved hull and more powerful engine, and again they up-armored a little bit to 8mm. Well, not much. Anyway, since armed with a single machine gun, they were not doing much other than reconnaissance and infantry support. Some of them were up-armored with a 20mm gun that did quite well against lighter enemy tanks. And it actually took out one Panzer IV, there's an account of, although it's not verified, and several of the uh, 38Ts, or listed 35Ts, which must be the checkmate. After the campaign, the German army used some of them in various support roles. And armored cars, they had about 100. That is a total of 1,140 totally, mostly, completely obsolete armored fighting vehicles. No wonder the horse had to do a lot of pulling in Poland. Now the Polish Navy, and we know the Polish Navy did a good account of themselves, especially those who made it onto Allied lines and served uh, under and with the British, especially that submarine, and there's a, there's a couple of uh, destroyers that, that did a good job. What did they have? They had four destroyers, five submarines, one mine layer, six minesweepers, and two gunboats, which is not a whole lot. Three of the destroyers and the submarines were ordered to sail to England on the eve of the German invasion. The destroyers and the two submarines made it to Leith in Scotland on the 1st of September, and the three remaining submarines were unable to break out of the Baltic Sea and were interned in Sweden. Damn Swedes again. Now, the Polish Air Force had 433 aircraft, 159 fighters, 154 bombers, 84 observation aircraft, and 36 liaison aircraft. And not really a lot of them were that modern. The Polish did have the PLC P-37 uh, bomber, which was one of the most modern bombers they had at the outbreak of World War II. And they did do a little damage, but a lot of them were caught on the ground. Now, interesting to note is, equivalent to the day's uh, dollars, the Polish Air Force spent about two dollars per capita on their Air Force, compared to Germany, which spent about a hundred dollars per capita on their Air Force. At the time, the Polish Air Force was very much obsolete compared to the German Air Force that was, at the time, the very best in the world. However, the Polish Air Force, they did, for a couple of weeks, give a really good account of themselves. They did manage to shoot down quite a few German planes and gave the Crown troops quite a bit of worries. But in the end, there was only one way this could go. Now, let's take a look at some of the very interesting planes that Poland's had, because Poland did have some really good innovative ideas on some of their airplanes. They were just weeks away from testing one of the most modern planes of its time when war broke out. Let's start with the PCL P-11, which was a great aircraft in 1931, uh, but had been overtaken by a whole lot of developments and events by the time of 1939. Four 792 machine guns, and it could carry four 12 kilo bombs. It also had, they had the P-7, which was a Polish fighter aircraft that was also designed in the 1930s. You had the PCL P-24, and you see, you look at these aircraft and you see most of their design inspiration came out of the end of World War I. Although some of these were built and exported, you had the PWS-26, which was a biplane still used for training as a training aircraft. However, you also had the PCLP-23, and honestly, it's a pretty tough, mean-looking aircraft. And it was the mainstay of the bomber force, for the most part. And it went to export, and interestingly enough, there were models of versions of this aircraft that, from what I can research, 
had a German engine. A new German engine. Well, there you go, Germans. It had a three-man crew, uh, had machine guns pointing in pretty much every direction. It was quite advanced. It had an incredibly sturdy landing gear that I actually really think looks pretty damn cool. It was designed in the mid-30s. The PCL-43, first production series, those 12 built. The A model was a much more powerful Gnomen Rune, if I'm not pronouncing that completely wrong, 14N-01 engine they built 42 of, and that does sound like the German engine that I, I mentioned. There was a 43B version with a 980 horsepower engine. The one I really want to show you, because I, I just think it's kind of cool, is the PCLP30 LWS6. I'm not going to pronounce Subar. That's what I read it's called. It's Polish probably called something. Ah, it's a cool plane. It, and it, it, just, it, it was a two-engine medium bomber and it was uh, produced by the LWS factory just before World War II. Short series were used for training only because it was just inferior to the PCL-37 Los, which was... The Los was a Polish twin-engine medium bomber. That was used in the defense of uh, Poland. There was also the Lublin R, which was an interesting, although a throwback back to post-World War I design, it was an observation plane designed again in the early 30s in the Plag Ileszkiewicz factory in Lublin. A lot of the Polish planes were designed to support army ground forces. Then you had the RWD 14B. I can't even pronounce that either. That was a reconnaissance plane. You had the Machin M9. The Cat C506 hydroplane, which means it can land on water. That is a cool looking, a little bit of a throwback to the Italians there with a three engine. So the Italian built Cant C506, which was the only non-Polish aircraft in service, uh, was purchased by the Polish Navy. And they bought six of them that was of course crewed by Polish air crews. They arrived at the Polish naval base and 44 kilometers north of Gdansk on the 27th of August 1939, cutting it a little close. The Puk base where they were was destroyed on the first day of the war when it was raided by German bombers in a surprise attack. First day of the war, killing the commanding officer. The first Polish officer was killed in World War II was actually this gentleman. So there were two planes that survived the initial German attacks of these two uh, hydroplanes. They're actually sitting in a museum today. The LWS-3 was an observation aircraft. Looks a little bit like a different version of uh, the Storch with a bigger engine. Two of those two play, two actually took part in the September campaign. Uh, one was shot down and destroyed. There's another water plane, the RWD-17, which was actually an aerobatic trainer. There's the RWD-8, which was a monoplane trainer. And interestingly enough, just to kind of round it home with the Germans selling all their stuff, there was a Focke-Wulf M3 that the Polish three-engine, but an old one. Poland bought the license and produced 20 of them for the military as a bomb version and 11 civilians. It had a crew of three and could take 10 people or 1,000 to 1,500 pound, uh, kilos of uh, cargo. Maximum speed was 200 kilometers and range was 1,000 kilometers. So not, not overwhelming, but they used them to transport fuel and uh, munitions. Now the Hawker Hurricane did play a very small part in 1939 before the German attack in September. Uh, the Polish government purchased 14 Hawker Hurricanes from the British. I, only one of them was delivered uh, in time and I don't think it saw any combat. I can't find any records of it actually flew against German forces. Then there's the PCL. 46 Sum, which is also a rather cool and tough looking aircraft designed in 1937 to replace the PCL 23B. Uh, they had uh, 300 ordered, 140 of them for frontline service, 160 for training and reserve. The plant was supposed to deliver 19 machines every month ooh, from about 1939, about September. They really just misjudged his own and with the possibility of being able to increase the production to 30 a month in case of mobilization. Needless to say, they did not get there. PCL P-48 Lampart 54 began an interesting, very, 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 very cool looking sleek plane. It was a full metal, low wing, uh, two-wheel landing gear, retractable, and a tail skid, 
uh, twin tail services, two sheet of cockpit, closed, four 7.9mm uh, machine guns, and the pilot had two 20mm uh, cannons placed on the bow of the aircraft. Interesting enough, it also had the Gnome and Röme engine. That's going to haunt me forever, just saying that. 730 horsepower each. The first flight and the first aircraft development was planned for the autumn 1939, but, of course, didn't make it just in time for World War II. Now, the mainstay of the Polish artillery forces were the 75 WC-97 gun and the 100mm howitzer. That was the mainstay of the Polish artillery. The light artillery regiments used them in infantry divisions. They had a 105 millimeter gun and a 155 that was used in the heavy artillery detachments of the infantry divisions. Uh, 120 millimeter guns were also used in separate detachments and reserve of the army artillery. The 75 millimeter guns were used in mounted artillery detachments of the cavalry brigades and the infantry gun platoons, infantry regiments. And there's the other types of 65 millimeter mountain and 76. 0.2 millimeter were rather limited. Now there was a lot of different weaponry in play here in Poland in 1939 from a lot of different countries of a lot of slightly different variations of munitions. One can only wonder how the logistics actually held up at the time of the invasion. So let's break them down a little bit. The Canon the 65M Southern Montage with the 1906 was obviously a French gun. Montage. French. Eh? Um, so they inherited some of those from the French. Then you had the 75mm 1897 field gun that was in Polish service. A French gun, again, and it was designed in 1897. The first Polish units to use this gun was allied was General Kosev Halle's Blue Army, created in France in 1917. In 1919, it had 117 such. They returned to Poland with its equipment. Henceforth, the French guns went to Poland. Thanks to further deliveries from France in 1919 and 1920, the Polish had 783 of these guns, which makes it the most numerous artillery piece at the time in 1924, 1925, 524 more were acquired. 108 of those may have gone to Romania in exchange for uh, some of their 76.2. In June 1939, just before World War II, there were 1,374 of these guns available with 153 in reserve. The average condition of the barrels were estimated to be about 70%, and they had a stockpile of only 7,000 rounds left, which in battle can be expended very rapidly. Then you had the Polish 76 millimeter 1902 and the 75 millimeter 1902 26 field cannons. In June 1939, just before World War II, there was about 400 of these guns available with 47 of them in reserve. Again, this was a French manufactured weapon and the Polish had used it quite successfully fighting the Russians previously. The Skoda Hofnisch VC-14 and the Skoda Hofnisch VC-14-19 was a Howard's model. It was a 100 millimeter, that's a 3.93 inch field howitzer. It was made in Czechoslovakia by the Skoda plant. And the Poles bought quite a few of those. It had a range about 9,970 meters with a 5 degree traverse, 5.5 degree traverse. Elevation was 7.5 to 48. And the shells weighed about 14 kilos each. Then you had the 105. WC 1913 and the WC 1929. Again, field guns. 105 field guns designed by French Schneider. Again, was that was the mainstay of the Polish long range artillery at the time of the outbreak of the war in 1939. Their range was lower than the newest opponents of the same class. The first one that was designated a 105mm Armata C. It was a very popular French cannon from all the way from before World War I again, and it was used by several countries. Uh, in 1929, the Schneider made a newer model for export with a sprit trail carriage and a longer barrel, resulting in longer range. The latter was also manufactured in Poland. In 1939, there were 254 105 field guns available in June, with 14 of them in reserve. 44 105s had been placed in order 
and some of those could have been delivered before the outbreak of the war. So the numbers could be a little different by the number of 40. Now the 105 guns were also used in eight wartime heavily, heavy artillery regiments and there was also a special use of the 105 for naval artillery. The 120 millimeter 1878 0931 and its cousin 1878 1031 field gun. Now the Polish army had been equipped with a moderate number of French heavy 120 millimeter field guns after World War I. It was a successful design and it was conceived by Charles de Barre, who were the, an inventor of the screw breech sealing method. Later adopted worldwide, it was still in use in French in big numbers during World War I. And even in World War II this saw service, although it was rather antiquated at this time. It was rebuilt in 1930s in Poland as the 1878-0931 and it changed its appearance quite dramatically and it served throughout World War II in Polish and Finnish armies and it actually stayed in reserve for another 20 years. Now the 122 was used during World War II in three heavy artillery detachments and they were assigned to reserves as well, each with 12 guns and three batteries. There were two horse-drawn detachments, number 46 and 47, and one motorized detachment, number 6. Heavy artillery detachment number 46 and 47 were mobilized by the 1st Heavy Artillery Regiment on the 6th and 7th September 1939 respectively, and they took part in the defense of Warsaw. Number 6 detachment was mobilized by the 1st Motorized Artillery Regiment and fought in eastern Poland. There's a lot of specifications on that particular weapon. The only thing I cannot find is the exact number in use at the time of the outbreak of the war but they saw extensive service with the Polish military, they saw service in Finland and other fronts, and for a long time after the war with the various upgrades and modernizations. The 155mm Snyder heavy mortar, or howitzer, saw service in Poland as well. Again, a World War I design that was modified and upgraded and sold on to the Polish armed forces, which was interesting because actually the 155 started with as a 152 millimeter at the beginning of the century. The 155 howitzer was used in heavy artillery units, also by uh, 30 regular army infantry divisions. A battery consisted of three 155 mortars and a battery of three 105 millimeter cannons type 2. These units did not exist during peacetime and were mobilized by peacetime as heavy artillery regiments. Uh, there were plans that the detachment should have a two four-gun howitzer batteries and one four-gun 105 millimeter battery, but none of this was realized at the outset of the war. It shows that about 234 howitzers were eventually assigned to the units of mobilization in September 1939 and took active part of the combat. And again, it did a great account of itself as pretty much the core of Polish defensive positions with forward observers, amongst others, the 2nd Detachment and 3rd Heavy Artillery Regiment took part of the defense of Warsaw, helping repel assaults uh, of the 4th Panzer Division. With the 7th Heavy Artillery Detachment fought against German 1st Panzer Division at Czestokowa. There were also cases where Howardses had to repel tanks with direct fire. For instance, the 6th Battery of the 6th Heavy Artillery Regiment defending an ammunition uh, depot at Horczko near Lviv, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, the conditions were not always favorable and a lot of howitzers were uh, lost due to hasty retreats. Alright, so the bigger Canon 155 made by Schneider, again French design, uh, made for World War I and again afterwards was adopted by the Polish military. The 155 is a caliber we have seen for a hundred years, which is a good solid caliber for field howitzers and also captured weaponry, captured 155s, were turned around and used by the Germans. Which brings us to the big super heavy howitzer uh, ordered by the Polish and delivered before the war started. The 220 millimeter howitzer, which is an 8.7 inches with a 128 kilogram shell, that's 262 pounds. It would have a range of about 14,200 meters by 15,500 yards. The muscle velocity about 15 meters a second, which is 1,600 feet per second. It is a 
siege gun. It is a that is a, its mount was uh, built for siege. It's a super heavy caliber. Although various types of munitions, including anti-personnel munition, were manufactured by the Germans, which captured quite a few of them, both in Czechoslovakia and in Poland. It was built and constructed by the uh, Skoda Works in 1928. The howitzers were only immobile, uh, fully traversable siege mount guns, which had been offloaded from a transport platform, had it built into a shallow pit before firing, and preparation time to fire this gun was about three hours. So for rapid warfare, this was not your weaponry. To break into somebody's fort or bunker, this was your weaponry. You utilized a hydropneumatic recoil system. Loading was manual, and they were heavy. With separate shells and bags and propellant, allowing for nine different propellant charges. For transport, the howitzer was disassembled into three loads, with each was lowered by a separate eight-ton tractor. The maximum towing speed was 30 kilometers an hour. Give you an idea how fast this thing was get where it was going. In 1933, 27 of these artillery pieces were ordered uh, from the Skoda Works by the Polish military, and as we know, that at least 14 of them were captured by the German military and redesignated the 22 centimeter Mercer. They were also the Russians also captured a few, which they used against the Finnish. Well, this brings us to the very core of the question Tom asked about Polish produced anti-tank weapons. They didn't actually build an anti-tank gun. Ish. They actually sort of did. They experimented with a 47 millimeter, which was the only one they built themselves. At that time, the predominant anti-tank weapon between the wars was the 37 millimeter that pretty much every country had and it was quite famous during the Spanish Civil War. Bofors in Sweden makes great munitions, great weaponry, great cannons used by everybody that could get their hands on one and they made the predominant at that time 37 millimeter anti-tank cannon and they exported it and also uh, had them built under license in different countries. Poland obviously used this 37 millimeter. Eventually, they started trying to build their own 47 millimeter. But back to the 37. This use was guns in pretty much all conflicts. It became well known and famous in the Spanish Civil War, uh, where it was successfully used against light tanks, and keep note on that, and armored cars. Because it was an infantry gun, it was also used as the main armament of a lot of light tanks and armored cars for quite a while, including uh, by the Germans, although of course they didn't use the Bofors, but the same 37 millimeter in some of their armored cars and light tanks all the way up until 41, 42. The 37 could do some damage, but it was obsolete by the time World War II ran around. It was obsolete as an anti-tank gun quite quickly but it was used as an infantry support gun for quite a while, pretty much throughout their entire war by all sides. It was cheap and easy and light, and honestly, into the Cold War as well, the 37mm found a place. So that brings us to the core of the question, the Polish anti-tank cannon. What did they actually do? They did build a 47mm uh, cannon. They were playing with a 47mm WC-25 Pushik. The gun was designed by the Polish factory Ammunition Works Polska, the bullet, as it was called. 1925 uh, won an infantry gun contest. Interestingly enough, the designer was an Austrian named Edmund Rulka. He was working in Poland and after World War I, uh, he designed this weapon and two prototypes were built. In 1926, the Polish army ordered four guns for you know, comparative trials with foreign guns. It was a pretty good design. Uh, the first modern gun designed in Poland, as a matter of fact. The particular feature was the twin-tailed articulate gimlet and the pivoting heels. It's a little different from what we've, we've seen before. And it could be fixed in upper and lower position to lower its silhouette. Uh, the gun did not however, enter pr production, because in 1930, the army changed its demands and requested better armor penetration. 
and then it decided to not equip its infantry with small caliber guns at all. Six to ten of these were actually manufactured. They were not adopted as infantry guns and they were stored. 1932, four of these guns, however, were fitted to an experimental light self-propelled guns, TKD, built again uh, on a tankette chassis. And these vehicles were used in a number of army maneuvers. They were used in fighting at the Czechs in 1938. They had a border skirmish and they were actually put in action there. It's not known uh, if they were used against the Germans in 1939. Since there was only a limit of them were used, and it was a very limit of them were made, it, very limited amounts of ammunition was made, so they probably did not see much service, and if they did, probably not for very long uh, against the Germans. They, all, they were also considered to as an armament choice for the Vickers E light tanks. But its anti-tank performance was just not good enough. The 37mm Bofors was chosen for the new tanks eventually, um, and they plans to rearm Vickers tanks were, were abandoned. So they actually went for a smaller caliber to equip their tanks with, despite the fact that the uh, Polish army had wanted more penetration. Obviously this is a a test bed cannon, but if a 47 millimeter has less penetration than a 37, well, something has gone wrong somewhere. The, the 47 millimeter 25 was a semi-automatic with a pivoting breech block, where the maximum rate of fire was up to 16 rounds a minute. Now, there's no information on barrel length uh, that I could find. Uh, the gun was equipped with a panoramic sight. The maximum range was 6,000 meters. Obviously, it had an armored piercing round, it had a high explosive round, and it actually had a canister round as well. The muscle velocity was 400 meters a second, and the projectile weighed about 2 kilos and 0.8 change, with the explosive weight of 4.2. The armor penetration was 25 millimeters at 750 meters, but it was tested against low quality plates, which means well, reading it the way I do, I said 500 meters, 25 millimeter armor, not sloped. That, yeah, not that good. That is actually not as good as the 37 uh, millimeter. Well, there you go, Tom. This is pretty much the answer to the question. They experimented with a 47 millimeter anti tank cannon. It wasn't good enough, and the British didn't find theirs good enough either. There are plenty of other opportunities and options, some I would have suggested rather than have kept going with the 37. Uh, however, that's where it was. I wish I could have found more photos of the Polish 47. I couldn't find any, and as far as I know, I don't know of any sitting in a museum anywhere. So if any of you know of any of those experimental 47, millimeter Polish anti-tank gun sitting somewhere, please let me know because I would actually, after all this, like to see one. But we can talk a little bit more about the 47 millimeter tests that were done by the Polish military since in 1934 they took possession of some 47 millimeter Vickers guns. Uh, the VA designated v v C E Vickers QF. It was a British tank gun developed by Vickers Armstrong, only made for export and it was the prime armament for single turreted light tanks like the Vickers E six tons. Um, they weren't used by the British Army in any great numbers and 22 of these guns were bought by the uh, by the Polish military for testing uh, to test in their light tanks and tankettes. So they had a, another foreign 47 millimeter cannon to test their own 47 against. However they found this one not nearly adequate enough and interestingly enough they estimated that their penetration was at 500 meters was 25 millimeters of plate armor vertical just as I actually guessed a minute before I came across this so they also had a telescopic sight to the left of the gun. The maximum range of the armor per piercing round was theoretically 5,600 meters. But if the thing will not penetrate more than 25 at 500 meters, shooting at targets 5,000 meters away seems like an incredibly bad idea that would do nothing else than wake up the people inside 
and invite them to shoot back at you with something bigger, which would pretty much be anything at this point. Um, so, according to Polish tests, they did not like this 47, and it wasn't used. Plus, the sights weren't very good, very good, and because of this, there was great dis uh, dispersion of shot. Which now finally brings us to the anti-aircraft cannons, which obviously, again, starts with the Bofors, which of course was the Bofors 40mm, built by Swedish Bofors again. Now, the 40mm Bofors uh, anti-aircraft cannon was incredibly popular. After World War II, it was upgraded to an L-70 that was longer, because aircraft now flew faster, and it has been in use all the way up till today. As far as I know, we still use it on select aircraft, and in the Middle East, it's still in, in active use. So, no wonder why the Polish chose that as well. They also had the French Canon the 75mm anti-aircraft cannon that was built by the French during World War II, and also in use by the Germans after they were captured by the French. They had a number of these. Canon the 75 started its life in World War I, as a field gun that was then eventually pressed into an improvised uh, field effortage for anti-aircraft use. And fast forwarding back to um, the late 20s, it was realized it was pretty much outmoded as an anti-aircraft weapon and a new barrel had been stuck in in 1928. It's all, anti-aircraft all about rate of fire and it fires a 75 millimeter shell that weighs about 6.5 kilos. The rate of fire is 20 to 30 rounds a minute with a muscle velocity about 685 to 750 meters a second. That's 2200 to 2300 feet per second. And effective range is about 8 kilometers, which is about 27,000 feet. Obviously, this was also adopted then by others, including the Polish uh, military as an anti-aircraft cannon, and uh, was quite efficient. And I know my own wild and crazy speculation, but I'm wondering why on earth did not the Polish and the French and any others take this gun and use that in an anti-tank role, put it on their uh, light tankettes or light tanks, had a higher caliber, higher rate of fire, uh, longer reach, it seems to me as the perfect obvious option for an anti-tank cannon and it already exists at that time. But that's just me going crazy out there. So the total strength of the Polish armed forces on the eve of battle was 2.5 million men, 40 divisions, 1,140 armored fighting vehicles, 1,800 guns, 433 planes, 4 destroyers and 5 submarines. And a lot of different infantry weapons. There's a lot of different calibers from a lot of different countries and a lot of things built in basements by the resistance during the war. At the outset of World War II and on throughout World War II, the Polish army and Polish resistance used uh, the following weapons. And I have to incorporate the resistance because they actually made a 9mm Sten variation called the Bluskavitsha, probably. The difference between that and the Sten was that it had a bottom-fed magazine and a pistol grip as opposed to what the Sten used. This was extensively manufactured by the Polish resistance in the underground. After that, of course, there's the Browning 303, the gun that wore the Battle of Britain. It is an aircraft-mounted weapon that chambers the British 303 millimeter rifle cartridge. And it went on a ton of airplanes and warplanes during out World War II. The Browning 303 basically was a an adopted, an RAF adopted version of the belt fed M1919, which itself was an air-cooled evolution of the original World War I era water-cooled M 1917, the British variant was designated Browning 303. And that was used by God knows everybody during uh, World War II, including the Polish. The Browning High Power 3 FN GP35, 9mm handgun. I love it. I have one. They are awesome. And they were used by pretty much everybody 
uh, including actually the Germans. What I have have a German eagle stamp on it. And no, it is not for sale ever. Uh, <laughs> there's also the Browning M1918 Bar, uh, the Browning automatic rifle. Or, well, it had a lot of not really very flattering uh, nicknames, and it is heavy as hell. Again, a World War I production that never saw use during World War I because the Americans did not want to bring it to the field out of fear that it might fall into the hands of the Germans. So they left their first-rate weaponry at home instead of giving it to their frontline troops. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure they appreciate that wholeheartedly. You had the Czech Soprovka VC-27. I'm actually surprised. I thought I actually got that right. The VC-22, great little firearm. Yeah, the Germans used it extensively after they took over Czechoslovakia and incorporating their own armory and obviously it made its way to Poland as well and many other places because of that great 9mm. We have the World War I Browning M1917 straight out of the trenches. It does not need much introduction. Belt fed, water cooled, saw extensive service throughout uh, World War I by almost everybody. After that you had the French light machine gun roughly inspired by the BAR, Chateau Model 1929. It was a reliable squad level uh, rifle that had a 20 round magazine and it fired a 30-06 a Springfield rifle cartridge. After that you had the Colt Browning M1895 also nicknamed as the Potato Digger. It was air-cooled belt-fed machine gun. That you had the Enfield patterned uh, 1914 rifle 303. Was 1914. It was a bolt action service rifle used like a sniper rifle. Uh, the Polish wholeheartedly used these. Uh, great, very reliable weapon. Then you have the FN M1930. It was, in fact, an American bar that was produced under license in Belgium and slightly modified as uh, the uh, FN MLE 1930. Then you had the Hotchkiss Model 1914, MLE 1914, medium machine gun. Now the interesting thing about the Hotchkiss Model 1914 was it was pretty much built by under license by a lot of different countries including Spain and Japan, redesignated slightly, altered slightly and chambered a slightly different munition. Obviously, it's made its way into the Polish arsenal as well. Even the Germans used it after conquering France and taking possession of a lot of those. But it saw use throughout the entire uh, time of World War II. Now, there was also, well, we speak a little bit of anti-tank cannons, but the Polish did have 3,500 anti-tank rifles. They had the KBWC-35 Maroszek. Again, pronounce it wrong, sorry. Anti-tank rifle. It was, well, loosely imagined on the bolt action system of the Mauser, and it chambered a 7.92 by 107 millimeter uh, lead core cartridge. Uh, the cartridge itself was in Polish origin as well, developed by Lieutenant Colonel Tatsuk. Again, I'm not going to do the name. They were specially developed in Poland for anti-armor, anti-tank roles, and you've got to think about these were developed and built and constructed at the time where light tanks were all the thing, and you had these little tankettes that could be fairly easily destroyed by these. These would also be uh, fairly deadly to Panzer 1s and 2s, and the Russians used uh, slightly bigger manufacturers of anti-tank rifles against Stokes and German tanks, Panzer 3s, and and force depending where you would actually hit you could do a little bit of damage and some penetration but they were a danger to German tank crews and then you had a French Leben model 1886 was a bolt action service rifle straightforward you had the Lewis gun I don't make me explain Lewis gun come on light machine gun LMG then you had a series of Russian made weaponries that uh, had been incorporated in the Polish military for instance, you had the 1938 120mm uh, infantry field mortar made by the Russians. You also had the 1941 82mm 
uh, field mortar, and the 1943 120mm heavy field mortar, and a 1943 160mm heavy field mortar made by the Russians. Now, all these Russian field mortars that with one exception, were all developed and came into service after the invasion of Poland in 1939, were all added to the Polish army roster of munitions and weapons used, which is a little strange considering they almost all came into service after Poland had surrendered and was technically out of the war. It is listed in the Polish Army Manual and Roster of Weapons Used in World War II by Polish forces. So you can then extrapolate and say Polish forces fought, some fought under Russian command during World War II against the Germans and were issued these weapons. And these weapons were also in use uh, quite a while after the war uh, by the then occupied by Russian forces, uh, Poland and the then under Russian control Polish army that were issued with these. You had some leftovers of the Mauser C96 broom handle. You had the Mauser model 1998 or Gewehr 98 bolt action service rifle. Everybody knows the Mauser. Obviously everybody used it. Everybody made these under license. Uh, I would not be surprised if there are not militaries using them today in some form for some reason. You had the uh, Maxim MG-08, Machine Gewehr 08 series. Again, a throwback that started before World War I. The Maxim saw uh, war on every front and obviously some uh, were left over and entered service in the Polish post-World War I military and subsequently after, the Russians used it as well. Interestingly enough, in the list of Polish armaments, the Molotov cocktail is actually listed as an official uh, weapon in their armory. So is the Russian Moisen Negant, uh, 1891. Again, bolt action rifle, saw service World War I, World War II, after obviously it made its way into uh, Poland. The MP38, 9mm machine pistol, which was the slightly more elaborately built, slightly more expensive manufacturer than the MP40, so it was the first version of what then became the next version, the MP40, 9mm submachine gun that we all know the Germans used. Of course the Polish used these as they took them from German soldiers and the systems used them as, uh, they, be, as they were available. And also there's some variation that has been made, basements hammered home on there on the MP40. You can actually make yourself, it's not a complicated weapon to make. And the Russians made a knockoff of it as well. Then you also had the Russian Nagant pistol, seven shot, uh, that of course made its way into the Polish armory. It was a 762 by 38 millimeter uh, R cartridge. I'm pretty sure we have one here at our, our little armory. Uh, I'm also pretty damn sure we don't have any ammunitions for it, but it it good old revolver. Then they had the Piat. Now the Piat grenade launcher was a standard anti-tank weapon for the British infantry during World War II. Now the Piat was rather clunky. It was heavy. It was rigid to. It was hard to reload, and rather bulky to manage in the heat of battle at 32 pounds with a three-pound projectile and engagement ranges reaches out to approximately 370 yards although effective ranges were within 110 yards typically and preferably shorter to make sure you actually hit something. It was three feet long and the projectiles featured a 2.5 pound hollow charge uh, impact detonation. It was leave the launcher at 250 feet per second. You also had the Polish manufactured VIS the Pistola VZ-35 uh, Rado, which held a uh, 19 rounds of 9mm and it was heavily inspired by the uh, Browning, although it had some design features that made it a little less than desirable. Some 50 plus thousand had been made in 1939 and by the time the war broke out, but they were not continued for use 
after the war because the Russians used their own. However, the production continued, and I've seen production numbers all the way above 700,000 of these uh, produced as they were used uh, quite widely by the, uh, by the SS and by German uh, army in general. That's why they continued to use them. Then you have the Russian-made PPS-42 and the PPS-43, the submachine gun, again fielding 9mm. You had the PPS-H-41, again uh, submachine gun, um, fielding the same. Now you had a Maxima Obrecht model 1910 PM model 1910 water-cooled heavy machine gun, which was pretty much the Russian version of the Maxim machine gun. Then you had four hand grenades, the RG-42, which was a Russian-made fragmentation grenade. You had the RPG, which was also Russian-made. There's also an RPG-43, denoting the year of manufacture. Again, Russian. There's an RPG-6, which was an anti-tank grenade that, as far as I can tell, was hand-thrown. The interesting thing about the RPG-6, it was a thrown hand grenade with the proverbial cone shape inverted uh, charge that had to uh, impact straight on armor uh, to be thrown at tanks. Several countries experimented with these, some even with parachutes, so you could throw them and the parachute would land it so it went straight on 90 degrees onto the top of the enemy tank. If it would you know, sit still long enough for your thrown grenade to fly down towards the top of it. And interesting enough, bad idea as this may sound, and it does, uh, this was used in the Yom Kippur War all the way up in 1973. They were still using these handheld thrown anti-tank grenades. And then you had the Schwarzlose MG. And we're going to get a couple pictures of that because that's just cool. Water-cooled belt-fed machine gun. Austria-Hungary made during World War I. Uh, which means this actually saw service for the first time in 1905. It was feeding from a 250 round munition stock and chambered 850 millimeter R uh, Mandlicher Austro Hungarian rifle cartridges. And the whole weight of the whole thing with the tripod was 42 kilograms. The overall length was 945 millimeter, with a barrel measuring 530 millimeters. Uh, of course, being water cooled, it had to come with a water can and all that stuff. Now, the Schwarzlose, oddly enough, was very well liked because it was a very simple, straightforward design, and it didn't malfunction, and it was easy to use. Stationary defensive positions, this was not a bad choice, although it was somewhat obsolete. Uh, due to the whole water cooling mechanism that was required. They even tried lightweight versions of this to put on aircraft, but that really was not a success. Then you had another semi-automatic self-loading carbine made in Russia that they used the SKS, which came in service in 1945, just at the tail end of uh, World War II in some form, which is interesting because I did not know that the SKS made it in World War II, which means now when I make World War II movies, I can bring my SKS if it's a late war movie. Well, there I go, learn something new. You, of course, they had the Sten that was dropped to the resistance by the British and used them outright, not just their own variations. They also had a Stoker's 3 inch mortar, which was an 81 millimeter light infantry mortar or trench mortar as such made by the British. You had a Somi KP-31, which was a Finnish-made submachine gun that entered service. And of course, a German-made Walther PPK, which was used by the German police. And the Walther PPK, I seem to remember a certain British spy in movies that always used that. Great gun, and I have one. So, that was pretty much the Polish lineup leading up to World War II. I know there's a lot of details in there, and it expanded the question quite a bit more than just uh, Polish anti-tank cannons. But I want to give it a breakdown and open the horrible, horrible door that I may have to do this again when some of you ask me for the same breakdown of other armies and militaries at the time. So, before anybody picks up that thought and asks me to do something 
that dastardly. I want to give you the picture of the week because I think after all this, we deserve one. Here is a picture of what is supposed to be a German gunboat with what looks like an Allied tank turret. Um, I don't know anything about this. I would love to know more. I've never seen this photo before. It does not look like a combination of things that I recognize. So, Drake, maybe this one uh, is for you to answer. Anyway, thank you so much. A reminder, all the photos are used in all my Q&As. They are on lostbattlefields.com. And also, send me your questions, military history Q&A uh, at mail, or you can find me uh, again through lostbattlefields.com, where all the different episodes are. Uh, I appreciate you take the time of liking and following and sharing uh, my, my, the work I'm doing here because I'm not funded by anybody. So when I go to Europe, like I just did, and travel all over different countries and film bunkers and battlefields for you guys, uh, the, it's all on my dime. So the more followers I have on my YouTube especially, a little bit more uh, commercial revenue I get in to for paying for this whole thing. So please uh, tell all your friends to follow my channel so we can actually get something done. I really don't want to spend my time on a useless day job or acting in movies when I can travel around and teaching everybody and learning myself about military history. You guys have a wonderful day of whatever day it is that you're watching this and send me your questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, not just in the singular like this one, and have a nice day.